Greetings from New York City, where millions find themselves indoors in isolation, hoping to stem the tide of COVID-19. The normally bustling city streets of New York are relatively quiet, as mostly what are being called essential workers are those that are out. Each of our church's regions are working through the leaders on the ground to share information about the needs of our members. Hope Worldwide projects are being coordinated. Partnerships with food banks and other charities are being rekindled because New Yorkers are resilient. So we are working together in crisis to fight this thing. We're slowly but successfully transitioning over to a virtual platform, whether it's for Sunday services or midweeks, small groups, Bible study, and of course our favorite fellowship. Our congregational leadership team has assigned a situational media task force that has been busy posting content and training the staff to minister through media. So just this past Sunday, we had over 15,000 people reached with our virtual church service. In it, we had worship music with sing-along lyrics. We had announcements, updates on COVID-19 in New York City, and a message of encouragement from our congregational elder and evangelist and a sermon from one of our regions. So many people jumped on that Facebook premiere live that it actually crashed and had to reset. Luckily, we had a YouTube channel simultaneously casting the message so people were able to jump on. The live chat feature was so encouraging as so many disciples were able to chime in and connect with one another. As expected, our brothers and sisters around New York are coming up with new and creative ways to connect virtually. They've had virtual double dates, e-encouragement cards, Netflix virtual parties, producing personal worship music playlists, online group games, group chats, WhatsApp, group me, everything, you name it, they're doing it. Some are even purchasing digital gift cards to be able to provide for those who have lost jobs and are in need right now setting up virtual care rotations for people that are also homebound and are unable to get things outside. One of our dear sisters here in Manhattan who works in the fashion industry is now a part of a host of top shelf designers who are devoting their time making medical masks to help the cause. We're all finding our way to do our part. I'm also happy to report that people are continuing to study the Bible to know Jesus whether it's on Zoom or Skype, FaceTime, GoToMeeting. In fact, one gentleman in Manhattan is doing the Bible study about the cross on Google Hangouts as we speak. Now, like Philip with the Ethiopian eunuch, our baptisms may not be well attended in person, but they are happening. We wanna welcome Rachel and Robert to God's kingdom, both baptized during the outbreak. And also congrats to Katie, who was baptized on Friday, and Amanda, who was baptized just this past Saturday. Dozens of disciples work as healthcare professionals in New York City, and we applaud their bravery. But they're also directly serving the sick, so we're asking for prayers for their protection. Also, several members have lost jobs, and businesses that are owned by disciples have had to shut their doors. Please pray for them. A handful of church members have also been infected and are getting treatment. Please pray as New York hospitals are already starting to get overloaded. In fact, right now, the USS Comfort is making her way to our shores. And just a few blocks from where we stand right now, the Jacob Javits Convention Center is being retrofitted to handle all the new incoming patients. As our biblical ancestors faced trials of many kinds, famine, disease, earthquake, war, like them, we here in New York are deciding to lean into these challenging times, knowing that God is our ever-present help in times of trouble. While we might shrink back from a hug or a handshake during this time, we will never shrink back from our faith. We miss you, we love you, we look forward to times of refreshing and fellowship with you all. Love from the Big Apple. Good morning. Welcome to this time that we have to worship God together. I realize that there are many changes that are happening to us and around us because of COVID-19, but it's good to know that we have this time, that we can come, that we can uh, take time to connect with God, to connect with each other virtually, but connecting anyway. You know, we have a God who does not change. He does not change with circumstance or with season. 
And it's good to know in a time like this that we have something, someone consistent and steadfast that we can turn to. Just recently, my family and I, we traveled to Nigeria to attend a funeral. And four days before we were to leave, we found out that we need to get out of the country because the airports weren't going to be shut down. So we had to quickly make arrangements and we ended up in Togo, West Africa, where we needed to spend two days before we could connect on another flight to get to the United States. You know, there were some anxious moments. We had to work through some things, but looking back, it was a good time to be in Togo because it allowed us sometimes to just spend time with each other, to reconnect a family. We're a group of 10 traveling together. It gave us time to just spend time with one another. We had lunch and dinner, uh, dinners together. We spent time just hanging around, but we also were able to spend a lot of time in the Word of God and in prayer to, uh, to get back, uh, to, to, to be close, and to, to just be still and know God. Uh, Tosa is going to share a little bit about her experience at that yeah. time. We would encourage you guys, you know, just like, you know, we had plans that were hijacked by the COVID-19 pandemic. We use that time to spend with God and to, with one another. And we encourage you guys, as you are all home at this time, to make the most of the time you have to spend good quality time with family and to spend time in God's word and with prayer and most importantly, getting close to God. Here's a scripture I'd like to share with you. You're probably very familiar with it, but let's, let's read it together in uh, Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. You know, let's be guided by the scriptures. Let's not give in to our anxieties, but let's pray with thanksgiving to God. And he, He's a God of all peace. He knows what we need and He will answer our prayers. Let's pray together. Dear Father, we are so grateful that you, the God who made us and put your stamp on us and told us we are good, that you are still our God. You're in control, you love us. Father, we know that the only distance, the only thing that creates distance between us and you is sin. But Father, we know that you are a God that's different from every other God because you draw near to us when we pray to you. So Father, we, we desire to be near to you. We pray, God, that you will give wisdom to our political leaders. Father, help them to set aside polit politics and uh, indifference and anything that would prevent them from being sensitive and gentle and kind to the need of the nation today. Father, we pray, we pray also that you be with our leaders here in this church, God. Help us to connect with the disciples. Help us to hear their needs. Help us to respond to those needs by coming to you and by using the resources that you've provided us with to meet those needs. Father, as we come together to worship now, I pray that this time will draw our hearts close to you and will draw us closer to one another. It, are, it is our desire to please you with our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hi, everyone. My name is Mark Sanders. This is my wife, Fiona. We're part of the Hudson Valley region, and uh, we're going to share some thoughts uh, concerning contrib uh, contribution today. I'm going to read a little bit of Matthew chapter 6, verse, uh, starting in verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Fiona's going to share a few thoughts. So last fall, we went to a workshop, and one of the exercises we were supposed to do was to spend 15 minutes in silence. I chose to go outside because I'm a nature freak, and I first saw two birds, and then I saw more and more birds, and they were various colors, and they were singing different songs. 
And this is a scripture that came to my mind, that God is providing for them and that he was going to provide for me and that I just needed to stop and be silent and to trust the fact that I am valuable to God, just as each one of you are valuable to God. These are uncertain times. I heard today about one of my best friends from college. His daughter was laid off and she's in the city. We don't know what's going to happen, but we just I just need to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. And I hope that all of you will join me in trusting that we are valuable and God will see us through. Yeah, and as we kind of continue on with what as Fiona was sharing about, um, you know, we all know Matthew six thirty three, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. In verse 34, therefore do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And, you know, this, it's easy to be challenged by this verse, verse but I, I, I use this verse also as bringing perspective. Um, you know, it's easy to be consumed with what's going to happen tomorrow. There's a lot of uncertainty about tomorrow. There's a lot of uncertainty about even today. But what God wants us to do is just focus on what's happening right now and to focus on the kingdom, to focus on uh, being righteous before him, and to trust that God will provide. And as we consider our contribution that God will provide uh, for you, uh, for the church, uh, that God will provide what we need and uh, will show us, you know, that we, um, that we are, are taken care of by him. And so let's say a prayer. God, thank you so much for just the way that you move in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to give. I do pray that you will help us to really use this moment to think about you, to trust that you will take care of us, that you have our best in mind, and that you are looking to work to make that happen. And thank you so much for um, just the ways that you've taken care of us so far. And I pray that you'll continue to help us as we focus on putting the right priorities uh, uh, in our lives, putting you first, the kingdom, and being righteous before you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. My name is James Warren, and I serve as the evangelist of the Harlem region of the New York City Church of Christ. I'm honored to be able to bring to you uh, today's uh, message, and I do pray uh, that you will find some encouragement um, at our time together. Um, at the conclusion of the message, we will break bread together. I'll uh, pray for the bread, which represents the body of Christ, and the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood uh, that flowed from Jesus that purifies us from all sins. So hopefully you are uh, prepared to take communion with us um, at the end of the message. Um, I think it goes without saying that we are in some pretty scary times. Um, I've never witnessed anything like this. I doubt you have, um, you know, we are, we are definitely in a, a storm, uh, if you will. Uh, you know, and storms are scary. Some, some storms can be very scary. Uh, they remind us of just how small we are, how powerless we are, how vulnerable uh, we really are. And in fact, you know, uh, James says in his letter that there will be trials of many kinds. And this is a trial of a kind that none of us um, was prepared for. I mean, if you think about it, um, it's clear that this, this, this global storm, no one was prepared for. Our healthcare system, our educational system, our economic system, we're not prepared for this. Travel industry, believe it or not, the toilet paper industry, the hand sanitizing industry, uh, small businesses, large businesses, all ill-prepared for the storm. Parents, we were not prepared for this. Overnight, I became a televangelist, uh, a math teacher, an elementary school principal. My wife became the lunch lady. She became a school, school bus driver. We were not prepared for this, all right? Uh, we're all teetering on the edge of uncertainty and borderline insanity uh, because no one was prepared for this. I recently heard about a conversation that gave me a little hope. 
uh, between a rabbi and a woman who was also teetering on the edge of uncertainty. And it went something like this. Uh, the woman said, this coronavirus thing has really thrown me. I feel like I've lost all sense of certainty. No one knows what will happen next. And how do we stay sane when we don't know what's lurking around the corner? And the rabbi responded with this. It's not that we've lost our sense of, of certainty. It's that we've lost our illusion of certainty. We never had it to begin with. And this could be major unsettled, majorly unsettling or amazingly liberating. This tiny virus of 125 nanometers has sent the entire world into chaos. All our plans up in the air. Markets are going crazy. Entire countries are shutting down. And we have no clue as to what the future holds. But that was always the case. Uh, we never know what the future holds. We only think we do and keep getting surprised when things don't pan out the way we expected. And now that the mask is off, we have to admit our vulnerability. What will happen next? We don't know. Our experts don't know. Our leaders don't know. Our government doesn't know. Only God knows. And that's the point. God knows. So close your eyes. Feel the uncertainty, make peace with it, let yourself be taken by it, embrace your cluelessness, because in all the confusion, there's one thing you know for sure. You are in God's hands. Keep calm. Panic and fear are also contagious. Take every precaution as advised by the health authorities, wash your hands well, and every time you do, Remember whose hands you're in. I mean, I thought that was powerful. You know, anxiety is high. Fear is setting in. You're about to lose your mind because you became a math teacher, lunch lady, elementary school principal, and gym teacher overnight. But God offers us peace in the pandemic. And my goal today is to inspire you to receive that peace that Jesus offers us in this pandemic. Uh, the scripture we're going to be looking at today is Mark chapter 4, verses 37 through 41. Mark chapter 4, uh, verses 37 through 41. And it reads in verse 37, A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind and the waves, saying, Quiet and be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you, have, do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, what is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. You know, some of the disciples were fishermen. You would think that they experienced a storm or two before. But for some reason, this furious squall took them by surprise. And they were unprepared and gave way to fear. Fear overcame the disciples. Now, here's the thing. Fear, fear is natural. And there are storms of many kinds that we have to try to be prepared for. Some you may be experiencing right now in the midst of this big storm. There's a financial storm. How will I have a job after this? Uh, will I have a business after this? Will I be able to come up from under the bills. There's the emotional storm. Wave after wave of bad news can lead to depression and further anxiety. There's the relational storms. Uh, things can come up in our marriage. You can't go anywhere for 14 days, so you got to work it out. Uh, if you're single, 
and you struggle with loneliness. Uh, you may feel an increased sense of loneliness during this time of isolation. And then there's that spiritual storm where for some of us who relied on those Sunday uh, Sunday services, uh, those midweek services, those small group discussions to be fed spiritually, and now that that spiritual structure has been removed, we don't know what to do. And we feel as if we're in a spiritual tailspin. You know, fear is a natural response when things are out of control. And God understands that. But fear without faith gives way to doubt. Doubt leads to disbelief. Disbelief leads to disconnection. And disconnection leads to spiritual death because we're severed from the head, which is Jesus Christ. You know, when fear takes over, we respond just like the disciples did in the boat. In verse 38, teacher, don't you care? For them, it was drowning. They thought Jesus didn't care about them drowning. But what is it for you? What do you feel like Jesus doesn't care about? What do you what do you feel like he's ignoring? You know, I remember uh, feeling the same the same way. Um, most of you know about the storms my family faced in 2015. My son's multiple surgeries, uh, losing my mom to cancer, um, all the unexpected family drama that came up. Um, all around the same time. And in addition to that, the daily pressures of leading the ministry. Um, you know, I remember praying and saying these very words, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that uh, my son is, 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 is suffering? Don't you care that my mom is dying? Don't you care that, that uh, I'm at odds with this family member? Don't you care that, that um, I'm feeling lonely? I'm feeling alone and, in all this, don't you care? And, you know, sometimes it feels like that. And it's because we're the ones panicking and Jesus is not. Uh, you know, the disciples in the boat will get an answer to that question very soon. You know, we have a choice. We can face it. We can face this thing like the disciples did in the boat with panic and fear. Or we can face this like Jesus, who was so at peace that he was able to take a nap during this storm. You know, to the disciples, they took Jesus' serenity as indifference. Now, serenity is not freedom from the storm, but peace amid the storm. And we often have this misconception that in order for us to be at peace, we have to avoid the storms of life. We have to avoid the trials of life. We have to avoid the trouble of life. But what that leads to, what that develops is weak faith. See, God uses those storms, those trials to strengthen our faith. Jesus, and thank God that this is who he is, but Jesus does not respond to storms the way that you and I do. Jesus responds to storms with faith. He was at peace, and the good news is that this is the same peace that he's offering to us today. In John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Ask yourself, can Jesus take a nap in my home? Or will he be awakened by prayers of panic? Now, Jesus gives us peace by giving us himself all of himself, including his power to be still amidst the storm. This is not the way the world gives us peace. You know, the world is thinking, I just want this to be over. I just want to get through this as fast as possible. I want this to be over. It's uncomfortable and I don't like it. But that's not the way Jesus gives us peace. You see, it's in his presence that we overcome fear and gain peace. And we need to embrace the uncertainties of this time because that's when we realize and remember 
whose hands we're in. Now, Jesus had silenced storm after storm after storm after storm in my life and in yours too. He did it with the power of his words. He did it by giving us himself. And I want to encourage you this week to face the thing you fear the most with God's promise. I want to encourage you to identify what that is and find a promise or a verse in the Bible that will help you overcome that fear and commit that verse to memory. And for me, it's Hebrews 11, verse 1, where it talks about and, and basically defines what faith is. And it says that, you know, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And I need that in these uncertain times. I need to hold on to something that will be there during these uncertain times. That I need something that I can anchor my faith in, anchor my soul to. And that's Jesus' promises. That's God's word. Now, James, you may be saying, how did Jesus, how did his disciples, or how did Jesus respond to the disciples when they said, don't you care? And I thought about that. Imagine Jesus being accused of not caring. I mean, let that sink in for a second. Jesus, of all people, being accused of not caring. Turn over to Romans chapter 5, and we'll conclude here. Romans chapter 5. As we get ready to take communion together, as we get ready to break the bread and take the fruit of the vine, I want you to meditate on this verse. In Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, it says, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So the question is, again, does he care? I think that the cross, Jesus' death on the cross speaks for itself. So as we take the bread, as we take the body, um, of Jesus that's represented by the bread and the juice, uh, which represents the blood. Let's remember, let's reflect on this peace that Jesus offers us, this peace that transcends all understanding, this, treat, this, this peace that enables us to weather this storm. Let's reflect on that and the fact that we get this peace through salvation in Christ. Let's pray. God in heaven, Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the bread which represents the body of Christ. We pray that as we break this bread, that you will help us to remember the sacrifice that was made for us on the cross. It's in your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen.